Welcome to the Passive Income Podcast March live stream roundtable panel discussion with Get Rich Brothers and at Drunk Dividends uh, Willows. And it is Ryan, right? If I recall correctly, it's been well over a year since you've been here on the Passive Income Podcast. Yep. Awesome. Well, first of all, thank you guys so much for coming on and spending some time here on uh, on the show. Uh, should be a great discussion. I definitely want to talk uh, Willows about the winery and the stampery. And uh, Ryan, we'll get into sort of what you've been up to in the last year as well. So I don't know, is there it kind of anywhere that anybody wants to start? I guess thanks, first of all, for having us back on the uh, Passive Income Podcast. You're doing... Uh, you're putting out a lot more content than a lot of people that put out uh, any podcast or whatever. I for myself, I have a podcast and I haven't put out an episode in like nine months. So like I respect the uh, <clears throat> very, very frequent posts. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks for having us back on. Yeah, same here. No, I appreciate yeah, well, you, uh, you having us back, Dave. And uh, and same thing. I mean, I've been following your content and you're super, super active on Twitter, uh, super active on your podcast. So uh, I think it's great for the to have that content out there for uh, all the viewers. Uh, it's a pretty big community and getting bigger, the you know passive income, financial freedom, financial independence movement. So uh, I think you're in the right spot. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for the kind words, guys. And uh, yeah, it's tough, obviously, you know, I'm, uh, it's actually been a couple of weeks since I've actually put an episode out or a week and a half. But uh, um, yeah, so great to have you guys here. I guess, you know, first I tag you guys in a lot of my train tweets and you see those like, I, I, you know, quite frequently. Um, I, I enjoy them. Uh, unfortunately, Anthony, was, Anthony wasn't able to join us uh, today, but he's a, probably the biggest fan of the, of the train tweets. And so I guess let's just start there with, uh, you know, the trains, uh, CN, uh, Canadian National and uh, and CP, I guess it's now called CP Casey, if I'm not mistaken. Kansas, yeah, whatever. So yeah, let's on, just yeah. jump into the railway. Yeah, I, I know you guys see a lot of those train tweets that I put out. For sure. Yeah. What is that? The the tracks like right in front of your house? Is that is that why we're getting all these photos all the time? Yeah, so, well, there's a, the road is basically right across the road. It's a triple track. It, the one closest to my house is a, is a CN, Canadian National, triple track. But then just like less than two kilometers down the road, there's a, 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 a CP single track as well. So I'm, uh, I'm right, in, right near all the trains by all Where the time. I'm... In fact, today during this uh, podcast, we'll... Uh, We'll count how many trains go by. I'll give you an over <laughs> under of 3.5 trains. So if you think it's under 3.5 or over, we'll just have a fun little under. game here while, while yeah, we're I'll go, while I'll we're go under. <laughs> I guess I'll go over then, right? <laughs> All right. Yeah, sounds fun. <laughs> I'm waiting for that half train to go by. <laughs> well, that's in, in the over under. You've got to put the 0. 0.5 so it's either over or under, right? Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, yeah, where I'm from in Winnipeg, we're like one of the only major cities in the country that just has train tracks like crossing all the roads because all of our train depots are just in the middle of the city and nobody ever wants to move them. Like the CN and CP have been like, yeah, we'll move the yards if you pay for it, city of Winnipeg. And the municipal government's like, no. Um, so I know there's like a bunch of laws that's like, oh, they can all, like trains can only delay traffic for this certain amount of time during rush hour or whatever. And Winnipeg's always failing because that we're just like, yeah, if you're going anywhere, if you're ever late to a meeting, just be like, oh, a train stopped me. And everyone's like, yeah, that that tracks because there's just tracks. They see what I did there. Um, so I'm less excited when I see trains than you are. But uh, the stocks, though, I'm very big fan of both. Uh, both those for a uh, dividend growth uh, portfolio for sure. Yeah, uh, I think I, I picked up, I bought them both at the same time, CN and CP both. Uh, I think it was 2015 or so, somewhere around there. So I guess it's almost 10 years now, but um, they're the sort of companies that I think you could just add to every year and not really worry about the price too much. It's, uh, I mean, it's one of those segments or sectors where how could you replace it right so it's it's like baked in that we're always going to need strong rail 
Um, and both CN and CP are, are making inroads to, you know, really be across all of North America. So you need them to, to ship. They're what, five times more efficient from a greenhouse gas, you know, whatever, whatever measure, measure you want to look at, aside from last mile trucking, obviously, but um, to get long uh, freight, you need to have the rail. So, yeah, I made a TikTok like talking about how safe monopolies and duopolies are because like right. there there was a conversation at the time about like how big does big tech need to get before the government steps in and says okay amazon you can't do this anymore um but something that's like going to exist as like a duopoly that like i don't think is ever going to get broken up is like the rail because what are they mm -hmm. like no one in 2024 is going to be like you know what i should do start a rail company and start laying tracks that's a great business idea so like they're just in this like necessity like situation where no government's gonna cut them um or limit them so they're just like unlimited growth potential basically as our population keeps going um canada is perfect for you know basically one straight line one road from coast to coast so just having the train uh like i get a bunch of stuff uh, a bunch of freight um for both businesses in my rail just because it's it's cheaper like um yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I mean, they'll grow at least with GDP. And then on top of that, they can grow with uh, there are all kinds of efficiencies that can be made with with rail. Um, when you look at artificial intelligence, machine learning um, right now, I mean, in the, in the past, right, it, humans and maybe some computer modeling around how they would ship things and how they would it would be, you know, be efficient and kind of project how they would, you know, ship things, ship all of the rail, their, their freight. But um, when you think about, and I know CN had had signed a deal with Google um, that would optimize and kind of they, they'd set up kind of these uh, I don't know these little bays, and the trains would just go through them, and the computer would will just completely analyze everything, including the brakes, uh, every everything to do with with the uh, train car itself, and actually put in the ticket if one of those train cars needs to go for maintenance type thing. So even as it's coming into the, the train yard, it's already being sent off without re requiring any sort of human intervention. So that's what they're working on. And so you think about how much more efficient they can even get. It's, uh, <clears throat> I think the dividend growth is pretty safe for the, at least for the foreseeable future. Well, and I guess that helps prevent like derailments or any other problems yeah. that happen, delays from Safer. maintenance and and imagine how much money you're spending on uh, on a derailment or something like just yeah. in delays alone, not to mention fixing the train. I mean, like yeah. and then lawsuits if there's injuries or anything like that, like so to prevent yeah. that is better for their bottom line as well. Yeah. Yeah, and then CP, I haven't followed I am them too curious. Too, but... Sorry to sorry to cut in right. there. I am curious though. In Winnipeg, have they not thought about like underpasses and overpasses? <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> we're um we are a city of almost a million people with a hundred percent surface streets. We don't have any any freeways. Um, mm -hmm. we used to be like fourteen different towns that they just like smashed together and built a bunch of bridges and just said you're a city now guys so it's on like 15 different grids and nothing lines up and um no one cares and that's a very our airport's just in the center of the city our train yards just in the center of the city and like no city planners were uh were were consulted i think at any consulted. point in this uh <laughs> in, in any point in this city's uh history but um we uh we we make do somehow yeah because doesn't the freeway like run in a circle around the city like you just it, basically you can bypass the city if you're on the trans canada yeah we call it the perimeter highway and it's just basically yeah, a circle around the city but then some genius like five years ago now they put lights on it so now you have to stop every 5k anyway and it's uh like i don't know they could have built like you know clovers and and exits and stuff but no they was supposed to just put four-way stops and put traffic lights that's fine um have you always yeah. been in Win winnipeg uh, willows born and raised here yeah um yeah i yeah i don't know i started a business here when i was 18 so i kind of it locked me down here um but uh, i have some property um in a couple different places in manitoba but uh yeah i've been here my whole life Okay, yeah, I was digging through some of your content. It sounds like you you set up a winery in was it right 
where did you actually set up the, the winery? Was it near Winnipeg or, or somewhere else in Manitoba? So the winery itself is in Winnipeg, um, right. in the St. James neighborhood, uh, 483 Berry Street. Um, but we have a vineyard in the Link south. Link in the description. The Check it out. <laughs> I, we'll talk about your new uh, wine tasting and what is it, like a tapas bar type of our room yeah, have there now as well? tasting room we call it. But uh, yeah, it's basically a restaurant now, which uh, I guess I can get into later. But uh yeah, so we have the yeah. winery in the city, and then we have a vineyard um, in about an hour and a half south of here. So basically, right on the United States border, um, it's a uh, valley um, called the Pemina Valley. So not as famous as the Niagara Valley, for instance, um, but it's uh, it's a valley nonetheless um, because it's not exactly wine country out here. If you know anything about this province, it gets very very cold. That's uh, what I was asking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. excessive. Uh, I've I've seen negative fifty degrees Celsius days in the uh, in the winters before. This winter that just passed was very mild, but um, we we do get very cold here. But um, the Pemina Valley, they tell me, is an area of low pressure, which um, creates this kind of microclimate, um, so suitable for uh, for grapes. I'm not growing like Merlot or you know Cabernet Sauvignon or anything like that, but we grow mainly uh, cold hardy hybrid grapes. Um, so we buy clippings from like the University of Minnesota's uh, agricultural research program. Um, so they're all basically just spliced like a good tasting grape that uh, won't survive the winter and a bad tasting grape that will survive the winter. And they kind of breed them together. Um, and then we're just be, we've been experimenting with different, uh, different kinds and varietals. Um, but uh, yeah, we just, uh, just had our seven year anniversary in, uh, in January and yeah. Um, in February, we opened a new uh, location. So we went from 10 seats in my old place to 100 seats in the new place with the restaurant event space. I think we're doing a patio in, in the summer. And um, yeah, yeah. So I haven't slept in a while, but uh, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, you said you got into that at 18. What would mm -hmm. have prompted you? Did you, do you have someone in the family that's, that's in the similar line, beverage industry? or No, my, uh, my parents booted me out of the house when I was 18 um we're on much better terms now but at the time we didn't they're both uh, public school teachers and uh when i started talking about you know la last year of high school i started being like hmm, maybe i don't have to go to college and maybe i should start a business and they're like mm, heresy not yeah. today yeah so i come from a long line of uh, public school teachers and civil servants and uh not very happy about that but anyways uh i uh after i got booted out i was 18 i moved into a house that i rented with like five other 18 year olds so i'm sure you can imagine we had a lot of people kind of in and out of there and uh my my business partner now um but at the time we were just friends obviously um we uh, started making wine in the basement um because we were didn't have jobs so we we're just like well we still want to drink in the trap house so we gotta you know <laughs> make alcohol and then it just got to a point where um people were coming over and they weren't bringing like beer anymore. They're just like, Oh, I'll just drink your stuff. It's way better. And it was like, hmm. right. Um, and then I found out at that time as well. I'm like, Oh wait, stuff costs money. Like the, the amount of cheese I've been going through with my parents is not sustainable because a block of cheese is $10 and uh, rent and uh, cell phone bills and all this stuff. Um, so I was like, okay, well I can either get a job or uh, start a business. And it's like, okay, well what business are we starting? And um so that was right around the time where people were like, oh, this is actually a really good product. And then we Googled, how would we go about starting a liquor business in Manitoba? And just, this is 2014. So this was completely coincidental that year, like three months before I Googled it. Um, our, we, in Manitoba, we have a very, we have a publicly owned liquor. So it's a, it's a monopoly, government run monopoly, uh, mm -hmm. but they did a bunch of deregulation in that same year just completely mm -hmm. coincidental so it was like I, I always say it was like a triple thread of like perfect coincidences that was like okay we need to make money here's something we're apparently good at and it just got easier to do right and, um so we wrote the business plan late 2014 early 2015 started approaching you know banks and credit unions and stuff trying to get a little bit of funding um did not go well because uh when you walk into a bank and you're 18 years old and you say hey I've never had a job before. I've never run a business. I have no credit history. I have no assets. I have no family members to give me money. Um, if you, I default on this loan, you have no recourse to get it back. Uh, they go, okay. And then what they inter when they think is like, okay, what kind of business do you want to start? You're like, well, I want to get drunk. Yeah. Um, so didn't didn't work very well. So we ended up working with an organization here in Canada called the uh, Futurepreneur, which uh, okay. specializes in like young. Um, 
underfunded entrepreneurs and basically what they do is like co-sign the loans so they broker uh between like us and the business development bank of canada um to be like okay well if they default we'll pay it basically and then it roundabout way your taxes are paying for it because it's a crown corp or whatever but um mm -hmm. so we uh we got money from them uh but all said and done we started for less than fifty thousand dollars which if you know anything about starting a business starting a manufacturing business uh very very low um as far as i know the next lowest um brewery that opened in my, in my province is like spent 10 times that on on the opening and most are spending two three million dollars um but yeah got all the funding together got all the business plan together um and then we had to do you know get a get a building get permits get equipment etc cetera, etc cetera. that took another year 15 months approximately and did they help with that process this futurepreneur like what what other guidance did they give you aside from the the money yeah they have like a mentorship program so they hooked us right. up with a um with another person who uh owned like a manufacturing business here obviously our beverage industry wasn't established so there was no one like specifically that but they're they in manufacturing which was like the closest fit uh mm -hmm. and then we would do like um you're you're like not required to do anything but you they like basically set up like monthly meetings with the mentor to kind of mm -hmm. tell you what to do and or not what to do but you know consult and, and mentor you um and then uh back in the day like the pre they've changed a lot now with covid but back in the day they used to do a ton of um networking and like they were always doing like um because uh the guy who owns the keg uh eisenstadt he's on the board of future or at least he was at the time so we would do these events in keg restaurants and like about like just invite uh potential entrepreneurs or current entrepreneurs and you could just kind of network and uh met a lot of great people through doing those but um yeah took a while to get all the uh all everything all the permits and then uh we opened early 2017 um january the 27th of 2017 um with four days before rent was due and we didn't have enough money to pay the rent in those mm -hmm. four days. So I had, I'm like, okay, well I got to sell two grand worth of stuff. Dave, give me the finger. Oh, there's a train. And that's the first train. Just so we're keeping count. That's the first train. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, basically ever since then I've, uh, not had enough money to pay the rent at the end of the month. I still don't. And then, uh, I just got to, but it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah. And then in, um, in uh just this summer past in 2023 i acquired another business uh manufacturing uh rubber stamps um so we do like uh rubber stamps mainly but we do like engraving name plates name tags buttons ribbons stuff like that so, awesome. so that's uh yeah i basically do the the bar full-time and then the, the sales the winery full-time and then the stampery full-time so um, about 100, 120 hours a week approximately which is is that all yeah that's well, like then I, time I, job. I drink the other six hours a day instead of <laughs> sleeping so i was just i was texting david like three in the morning i'm like all right i don't know i can't do the uh time change he's like eastern time i'm like what is that like on my couch <laughs> drinking and then uh i stopped drinking like four hours ago before this podcast so. <laughs> good stuff good stuff <clears throat> Yeah, I don't know where we were going, Ryan. You were doing such a great job there at at, uh, <laughs> at, at hosting. <laughs> at hosting. The show. You can just sit back and. Uh... <laughs> well, that's why that's why I stopped. I'm like, okay, I'll just I'll I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know. So, so my expertise, my expertise comes from like um you know business operations, and uh, honestly, I'm not a very good like stock market investor, um, which is why I like like being kind of involved in the in the the you know fin twit div twit kind of community because it's like i can use your guys's due diligence um mm -hmm. because i'm not i'm honestly not very good at stock trading mm -hmm. um but i know how to run businesses apparently right well i mean that's kind of the warren buffett model right so you have uh the businesses that, that you have and some very diverse businesses obviously wineries and stamping are completely completely different right but the i guess the uh the ownership mindset uh, came, is the same, right? And in how to develop a business, whether that's uh, you know procurement or hiring, managing people, that sort of thing, uh, those are transferable skills. And then uh, if you look at Brookshire Hathaway, right? You know, at some point when you're you know getting a little bit flush with cash, uh, cash flow positive, you can start um, using that money to to funnel it into other businesses or 
in like if you again if you look at brookshire i mean they own a lot of companies outright but then they also own a lot of a lot of stock so whether it's apple or coca-cola or something like that right so they just they kind of survey the whole landscape of what's available whether it's private businesses or publicly owned you know public corporations that are on the stock exchange and um and just decide where the best places to deploy the capital so <clears throat> that's how you that's how you can continue to grow it in some sort of like a holding holding company format right or model yeah yeah we're um yeah i don't know i'm just kind of making it up as i go along honestly but uh yeah mm-hmm. i saw on your uh was it on twitter i forget i was i was going through your content ahead of this uh, podcast and um it looks like you're are you're looking still for more businesses or yeah i mean like i'm always open opportunity i'm kind of like up to my eyes and dead at the moment um i'm hoping interest rates go down this year but uh sounds like um, they will Sounds like they will. Yeah, I'm hopeful. Um, we we took a lot of debt to get these renovations done. Um, but it was just like I was working out of an 800 square foot building. Um, with the winery, and it was just right. like we could we were bursting at the seams. I had to get like a second storage unit because we just didn't have the enough space for the aged wine and stuff. So we we just needed to move. And if we were gonna move and sign a you know 10 year lease, there was no point not to build a full bar like like we always wanted um so we did have to take a lot of debt to uh to get all those done so that's all on variable rates and rates are not great right now um it's always funny when i talk to my parents and they're like interest rates are going up we're so happy and i'm like (laughs) yeah (laughs) great um but uh yeah i mean like uh the the stamp business the stampery is i think i coined that term um, which I'm glad Dave uh, calls it that too, because it means it's catching on. But um, I was like, I I often like I'm in a couple Facebook groups for like businesses for sale, and like I have friends that have um, uh, MLS or whatever, like they're real estate agents, so yeah. they can see the listings and they'll they'll send me stuff that they think I'm interested in. So this would have probably been the the tenth um, set of books from a business that I looked at that year. Um, because sometimes like just to you know you never know what you don't know, right? So it's just like. Uh, just I, I like to usually and like for the listeners at home, most people that are selling businesses like it's it's like just be like, hey, can I see, you know, three years financials and a, and a balance sheet? And they'll a lot of times they'll make you sign an NDA and that's that's fine. And then do that. And you you can usually most people, if they're motivated to sell, they're going to sell. They're going to show you the books with not too much hassle because no one's going to get farther in the buying process if they're if you're not looking in the books. Um, so I, I did that for yeah, probably about 10 businesses in 2023. And then that one was like, um, the numbers just made sense. Um, it was run by two, um, two people who bought it. Like they had worked there since they were like 18, basically 18 and 20. Um, the business was founded in the thirties, 1932. So it was like the owner, uh, pass it down to his son who ran it and then when he died the like three employees bought it out and then they and then one of them passed away and then the two that were left had been running it till till now and they want to retire and uh i remember i looked at it and i sent it to my business partner because i was like haha look at this hundred year old business that's like lost two grand last year this is mm-hmm. this is funny because I just did a cursory glance over it. But then my partner comes back to me and he goes, wait, 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 wait. No, no, no. look deeper at those books. They lost two grand last year because they paid themselves 80 K. Right. So like way above market for, you know, like they were working three yeah. days a week. Um, but it was like, so we're like, okay, wait a second here. If we take that money, put it into a full-time manager, mm-hmm. servicing a loan to buy it, um and then you know whatever like if rent goes up or we you know whatever miscellaneous it's like there's still a margin of of profit monthly cash flow uh that would be available here um so numbers made sense we took about probably two months of due diligence process uh my lawyers and accountants you know went through everything to make sure you know because anyone can put whatever they want in a quickbooks and you know it doesn't mean the numbers are 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 true but we went down and and kind of looked at the machines and toured the place and met the people and um I know, and uh, it's uh, it's been good um, hiccups, but uh, the the manager we I had originally hired to run it uh, ended up quitting uh, unexpectedly, which was not great. So I had to kind of step in and do it full time for a bit, um, and then that was during when we were doing the renos, so it was like it was a lot. 
but uh, now I've hired another person that we're training and it's uh, we're I'm slowly kind of taking taking back because my summers are very busy um, for the winery and this is we're coming up to summer in a, in a couple months here so I got to kind of I just can't put the hours at both. And is this a local Winnipeg business or is it, uh, yeah. this, this, okay. Yeah. And yeah. Do you do most of your sales online or is it uh, kind of an established business in, in Winnipeg and you have a lot of local clients? Yeah. Business? Like they didn't have any, any online when I took over, uh, right. they had a website that was like just, uh -huh. <clears throat> um, copyright 1999, uh, with like, um, if you clicked on the about us, it was just like step-by-step -step turn directions to get there with like a map quest printout and then right. just like um disposable camera photos of the products that we sell basically so um and then like no social media and whatever so 99 percent of our um well okay wait maybe 90 percent of our business is, is mostly wholesale clients uh, a lot of law firms uh schools banks um that are buying, you know, uh, bank teller stamps, uh, lawyer, uh, we do corporate seals, uh, embossing seals, stuff like that. So a lot of, uh, like that, um, our, uh, public utilities, Manitoba hydro buys a lot of stuff from us as well. Um, so a lot, yeah, a lot of big wholesale clients, but I'm trying to pivot more to, uh, direct to customer, um, mm -hmm. because you know, wholesale is great, but, um, I built the winery off of like selling one bottle to one customer. And that's what I, I think really, you know, builds brand loyalty, number one, but then also I think that's just the best way to the best customer experience is just like focus on one sale very like, um, so we, we like opened an Etsy when we took over and I'm, I'm working on some, some e-commerce and stuff like that. I want to go more, um, direct to customers. Um, but, uh, yeah, mostly wholesale right now. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, this is a great story. Willow, is, uh, I'm just going to jump back in here. Let's uh, let's jump over to you, Ryan. What have you been up to for the last year, year and a half since the last time you were on the on the show? Uh, really, just uh, you know, working and uh, some travel. Um, took a a trip last year and just uh, wanted to go for a drive. Went down to Washington D.C. and spent a few days there, in Nashville. Um, yeah. Uh, aside from that, just as far on the investing front anyway, just kind of building positions that I already have. So uh, Brookfield infrastructure, so BIP. Um, yeah, really just uh, kind of taking it easy, but uh, reinvesting dividends as they come in. And uh, and yeah, that's that's kind of <laughs> kind of been what it's what it's been for the last. It uh, sounds like a lot less busy than than Willow's uh, with all the businesses and. Uh, <laughs> I think most people can say that, that right. they're less busy than Willows. So I, I wouldn't feel bad about that. Yeah. Yeah. And yourself, Dave? Well, I was just going to say, uh, you know, that's a great approach. Like, it sounds very boring, aside from some nice travel, like go down to, to Nashville and D.C. and see some uh, things and places and, and whatever. But for the most part, that investing style, just that boring keep accumulating, keep adding to the positions that you already have, keep reinvesting your dividends so boring it's which makes it so awesome right like yeah we all get uh, excited about how boring it is yeah <laughs> right well one of the things that's kind of more interesting that's been happening lately uh, just looking at uh, meta for example uh, initiating a dividend i thought that was really interesting now it's a super small dividend it's like almost negligible but um we'll see as they increase that over i mean I'm assuming they're going to continue to you know increase it over the years, but um, I, I think it's an interesting sign when you see a, a tech company that just you know two years ago or whatever it was, whenever they changed their name to Meta, they were talking about really investing heavily into this metaverse and kind of going, doing this hyper growth phase where they're going to be dumping all kinds of money into growth, and then you see them initiate a dividend not you know not too long thereafter, and I think that's going to be maybe a bit of a sign we'll see if other companies follow suit like a google for example or alphabet if they if they follow um but as dividend growth investors and i do have positions in some of these tech companies like google and like facebook or meta and uh, <clears throat> anyway i just think that's an interesting paradigm shift um as far as in the past it's almost like a sign of uh, uh capitulation or, or kind of throwing in the towel for a tech company to to initiate a dividend uh, there were some exceptions like microsoft for example that's paid a dividend for years and years but apple after steve jobs started paying a dividend so um again i think that that model is uh that's what i was gonna i was gonna say apple because like apple's mm -hmm. is at 0.56 percent right now right. which is like 
you could consider almost negligible as well as yeah. well i know there's always that argument between like should they just be re like apple is going to redeploy their funds more efficiently than you are paying you yep. what 24 cents a, a share um right. so you would rather them invest in um in growing their their, their stock price but mm -hmm. um at a certain point it's like how much cash does apple have like literally a trillion dollars not literally but like you know what i mean like a yeah. lot of money it's mm -hmm. like who doesn't know about iphone at this point um yeah. and like i think facebook's kind of getting that position too where they're just so dominant as a social media um mm -hmm. well, like as a whole between instagram and everything they own it's like okay, and everything else yeah i don't know i i i think a dividend is uh makes sense i think in their position when you kind of reach this like dominance where you don't need to be focusing on on growth as much um but it'll be interesting to see what they do with ai right like that's what every all these tech companies want to now jump into which is funny how fast we made the switch from like let's have weird avatars in the metaverse to <laughs> like just ai 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 it was it was an interesting tech shift over the last like year and a half yeah it was very fast like you said 18 months right you know 18 months two years ago it was all about the metaverse and how that was going to be the next big thing and then all of a sudden around the beginning of last year the beginning of 2023 everything was about chat gpt and and now you chat gpt is just one of so many that you hear about now a year and a, and a few months later but you're right it's all it seems to be all about ai i think that is also an, an interesting point or, or topic of discussion these uh tech firms tech stocks that are paying dividends but as you pointed out they're such a small yield right and I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure the the meta yield is very low. Uh, obviously, you just read the the Apple yield extremely low. Um, I believe Microsoft is also extremely low. And mm -hmm. you know, if Google or or Amazon or whoever else begins paying a, a dividend, they those yields will will undoubtedly also be extremely low. So, mm -hmm. I guess maybe just any other thoughts on. <clears throat> on sort of that are, are you better off maybe to if you're focused on dividend investing or dividend growth are you better off to, to put those funds somewhere where you know you've just got something that's paying you that steady five, say five percent yield i think it depends on your purpose and also your timeline right like if someone was uh was, was is i think first of all it's it's important to have some exposure to these to these sectors because I don't know exactly what's going to happen with AI and tech in the future, but it's not hard to predict that the companies with the most data are they going to be the ones who continue to win over the long term because data, data, the whole thing's fed on data, right? Like that's that's the engine, that's the whole growth engine. And so, if you think of a company like a Google or a Meta, the ones who have all of our personal information, all of our activity, everything we click on, everything we think about, right? Um, I mean, even when Willows was was looking to start his business in 2014, he was Googling uh, to see what sort of opportunities there were out there. And, and that's going to continue. YouTube as well, um, like all, all of this data that they're generating. I think there's a few ways to do it. One, you, can, you should balance your portfolio, right? So um, if I wouldn't say go completely into tech. I wouldn't say completely avoid it. And also there's a lot of yield traps out there too, right? So if someone's looking for a high yield, that can also be dangerous. So um, I, th I think looking for a portfolio that yields, you can comfortably build a portfolio that yields somewhere in the 3% range where you have a good, good balance. And I mentioned earlier, Brookfield infrastructure. And one thing that I love about a company like that is the data centers, right? So they have data centers and all of this data that's being collected has to be stored somewhere, right? And and then within, within those data centers, if you're looking at like Oracle cloud infrastructure or AWS, you know, that's where they can they can put these machine learning algorithms to work and kind of start mining that data and trying to figure out consumer habits, where things are headed. And, uh, and, and yeah, so I think you, it's, it's kind of this whole ecosystem that's just exploded uh, over the past two years. Like, like you said, ChatGPT was really that watershed moment where once that came, I think it was November 2022. Or, I, I, don't quote me on that, but I think somewhere around there. And then I remember at a Christmas party, that's all people were talking about like a month later. And it's just continued, <laughs> continued since then. And it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of, it's integrated in all aspects of our lives now. And you look at what Microsoft is doing with their M365 platform, integrating, you know, their co-pilot and everybody's, everybody's doing this. And I think there's going to be a, a number of winners type thing. So I, I don't think you have to choose one company or, or two, but I, I think having, having exposure is important. And going back to your point, uh, Dave, you could, for example, have some of these 
really low dividend yielders. And one of the reasons the dividend yields are low on some of them, like an Apple or a Microsoft, is because the stock keeps going up, right? So it's it's a sign of growth that the dividends are so low. When when in Microsoft's case, for example, they've been growing their dividend for I don't know how many years, but years and years and years, and and yet it's still a low yield. Like I bought them at I think a hundred and. 160 or 170, I don't know if they're around 400 now. And even when I bought them, I was like, uh, oh, they're too expensive, but I'll buy them anyway. Because I was like, I just want to start, I got to start a position at some point. So, uh, and I, I think some, you know, we'll be talking. The number of trillion dollar companies is going to continue growing, right? Right. Well, I've been saying that about uh, NVIDIA for, yeah, since $200. I've been like, nah. It's overvalued. Yep. I like. I just can't find a position. It just kept going up and up and up and up and up. Yeah. And that was an. That's an interesting case study of like just, um, where like I guess like hype meets like they are making a lot of money, and yep. they are they did have a amazing couple of years, and it's just but it's just an interesting like um, they needed AI. AI. They were in the right place. It was. It was. Yeah. That, that reminds me a lot of uh, John D. Rockefeller and Standard Oil. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they had oil and what was it used for? It was used like kerosene lamps and things like that. But then uh, another really important thing came along, which was Henry Ford and, you know, the, the whole automotive industry. And suddenly they had this crazy big use case, you know, for, for all of this oil and this, you know, gasoline and everything that, that went from there. But that that need only came after he had already developed all this infrastructure around standard oil. Right. So he, I think he made more money in retirement than he did while he was actively working because the, the auto industry and everything around that uh, just exploded. So it's the same thing. NVIDIA was already making chips. If yeah. NVIDIA had waited, and it's one of these things where you know, imagine NVIDIA had waited until open AI and AI was really at a place where it was to start developing. Yeah. If they, if they just started developing at the point, you couldn't start a company right now and like and like overtake Nvidia or AMD or some of these companies, right? So it's it's I don't want to say being in the right place at the right time, but you know doing your job well, and then sometimes an opportunity will come that that, that you can't really foresee how explosive it was going to be, because I, I don't think when they started Nvidia, I don't know the whole backstory, but I, I'm sure they weren't they didn't they didn't have this they didn't see so clearly what you know where things were headed. Probably had an idea, obviously computing and all that sort of thing, but AI in the last little while is just taken over and the demand for chips is I don't, the runway is hard to <laughs> yeah hard to see an end right yeah yeah the big thing i with nvidia too is like you know chips go into everything now whether it's automobiles or i've made this point several times like you you know heavy heavy machinery like caterpillar another Not great here. stock that gets talked about a lot yeah. All of these big you know heavy equipment they all have computer chips now you get into a cab of a, of a brand new uh, excavator and it's, you're like a, you're in a spaceship right like it's yeah. it's absolutely phenomenal so it, you know or or you know john deere and, and farm tractors and farm equipment like mm -hmm. you know gps for it, well you know like out there in the prairies you've got these basically like thousand acre farms and 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 they just have their whole plots of land right down to a science from from gps and well what is what do they need to run all of that well they need chips in in their equipment right so well, and the other, NVIDIA, the other big piece on that, or AMD. Right? yeah, and, and farming, one of the big, big things there is, of course, like you said, the heavy equipment and the machinery that they have, but then also just computer modeling around weather patterns, right? Um, where, you know, it, we're semi-sophisticated right now as far as like the weather network and that sort of thing. But I mean, the forecast changes by the minute, even like, even today, we, you wouldn't, the, the, the forecast is going to change kind of as the day goes on. But whenever right. you can dump just unbelievable amounts of data into the machine into you know these these algorithms and, and let them churn it out eventually they're going to get very very good at predictive uh weather patterns and and again letting you know and, and i don't even know all the the ways that will be used in the farming industry because i'm not i'm not any sort of expert in the ag agricultural side but you can just it's not hard to predict that that's going to be super impactful for them as far as getting their crops ready and um yeah. especially as weather patterns continue changing because I, I mean even even here uh, in Ontario, um, the other day, the weather was like plus 17. And then yesterday it was like minus 17, like within a few days. <laughs> like, yeah. So if you, and, and my brother was just saying, he's like, yeah, I was just in the, he's like, he was doing some gardening, getting kind of the, some, some of the shrubs, you know, set up for the spring. And then next thing you know, we get dumped with a bunch of snow. <laughs> it's just, yeah. Yeah. We had a record snowfall year followed by a record opposite way. Like, not yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. 
And it's uh, as someone who has a bunch of plants and and vines and stuff, um, mm -hmm. very difficult to plan for the future when I don't know what a winter is going to look like. Because, um, yeah. you know, we want to future proof all the plants, all the like we plant new rows every year, basically, and we want to future proof them. But it's like you don't know how what it's going to look like in, you know, 10 years when these plants are mature. So that's yeah. uh, it's going to be a challenge for the whole agriculture industry, I think, uh, dealing with it. Uh, going back to NVIDIA and the chips and AI and everything involved in that, and that's just kind of always the example I throw out there is like the heavy machinery, the Caterpillars, the John Deere's agriculture, because that's something that people would never really think about until you kind of bring up the point. But, it, you know, they just go into the, the, the chips, the NVIDIA and everything else. They just go into pretty much everything now, whether it's, you know, laptops, cell phones, uh, all these EVs, electric cars, and... You know, the list just goes on and on and on where these chips are going. So you just see that NVIDIA stock continuing to rise and rise and rise, not financial advice, because at some point there will probably be a market correction. But it, it's just it's, it's tough to fathom seeing it going any other direction than up. Right. Yeah. So, as I mean, IoT, right. Internet of Things. Everything's connected yeah. now. Pretty much everything you buy has some some way that it's connected to the Internet. Um, and again, the data is being collected, the data is being mined, and they're getting, you know, the insights are getting are getting better. And I, I can't remember, NVIDIA, I think, is what now the second biggest market cap? I, I haven't uh, looked too closely, there, but I think they might be the second biggest market cap right now. And it's funny, because I think the average person probably doesn't even know their name. Like, I, 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 I mean, we, we talk about these things, but I, I think most people walking around have no idea whether it's an NVIDIA chip or anything else that's powering yeah. their computer, or their laptop, or, you know, that sort of thing. I don't think and, anyone heard about them before yeah. this like run up that just happened. I think the average person wouldn't know. Right. Maybe if you were like, you know, a gamer and you knew about Nvidia graphics cards or That's how I knew. Nvidia yeah. graphics cards. That's the only reason. <laughs> like I was Bitcoin mining, like GPU mining in 2020, 2021 and uh so I was buying a lot of Nvidia cards back then, but like I didn't even know about their all their how much money they made off uh the chips and stuff and all the stuff they want to do with quantum computing is like getting above my like realm of mm -hmm. understanding of like how stuff works but they started to talk about like chips that are smaller than atoms and stuff which is like theoretically possible and it's like what are we what are we talking about guys <laughs> like and, and just for uh their third by market cap behind third. microsoft and apple by about 300 billion dollars okay so on any given day, that's going to fluctuate, you know, given how big they are. <laughs> yeah. And uh, but yeah, it's it's a really funny thing when you think of a company that most people probably don't know about <laughs> being that being that massive. Um, and again, it, it gets to kind of that world, the way things are trending, where it's this kind of unseen world. Right. So it's like AI, AI machine learning. What do these things really mean? Uh, large language models, LLMs. Right. That most again, most people are, are going to be using these products and these these tools but not even not even have any even faint understanding of what it is um and it's going to be interesting to see how that how that you know the income gap right the disparity between the rich and the poor and all that sort of thing i think that's going to continue to widen just because um the people who can understand and, and really use these things like to to benefit from them is is going to be a very is, is going to continue to be a small number Whereas you have most people are getting hooked on their phones and and all of the insights that are coming out instead of having ten thousand you know all these engineers trying to figure things out you have the machine actually now getting smarter and and what's that result in more screen time more more time clicking more time scrolling for the average person the average person who has their phone right so and when you're doing that you're not productive right you're not doing anything you're not building something you're not building a business you 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 think you're being productive because you're seeing all these things and. But you're not right and also the divide i mean I, i've never seen so much political divide and really it's on the u.s side in canada we're pretty passive as it comes to politics and whatnot but on the u.s side the, you know this next presidential campaign that's coming up so much of that is going to be driven and dictated by what's on social media uh which is very divisive and it becomes an echo chamber right and the machine the machines now are the ones they're so good at getting people to click on the things that outrage them or right so and again more screen time more advertiser dollars and the people don't even realize that their face time their 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 attention span is what's being mined 
you know, financially. <laughs> well, the, uh, the AI voice stuff is getting so good now that like, yeah. you can't even like, I saw something yeah. on Facebook that was like some Trump, like it was Trump talking and his mouth yeah. was mouthing the words and it, but it was, it wasn't real. And yeah. it has like a hundred thousand shares of people yeah. thinking it's real. And it's like, and yeah. you know, Facebook doesn't, like Twitter at least has community notes and stuff, but like yeah, <laughs> Facebook yeah. is a lawless wasteland of boomers that don't care or understand mm -hmm. the internet or what it's capable of. Mm -hmm. But um, even like there's um, there's like scam callers. They'll they can emulate your voice. So like I have so many clips of me on the internet. Like you could easily build a language model off of mm -hmm. what I've said, and mm -hmm. you can call grandma and be like, "Hey, I need send me this money, right?" So. The technology is um, already there for someone to recreate this stream right now, and it would look like all of us were having a conversation that we never even had. But you know, like the technology is already there for that for that to be done. It's yeah. it's it's insane. It's going to get to the point where you won't be able to you won't be able to trust anything you see unless you're physically seeing it in the room with you. Okay? <laughs> and even then, <laughs> even then, <laughs> um, I I like when we were talking about ChatGPT and like just not like the average person not knowing the capabilities of or like what we, you were saying. Uh, I remember when around the same time that you were talking about it at that Christmas party or whatever, I had a couple acquaintances that were being like, this is stupid. Like, it's just <laughs> like, I don't know if you guys remember like clever bot back in the day, but that was like big in my like middle school. It was like, it was just the a very basic like language that you would, that you could talk to and it would like say stuff back to you and it would learn. And um, they basically think ChatGPT is that, but more advanced. Like, I don't understand why everyone's talking about this. And it's like, like I use it for my businesses. Like I use it for copywriting all the time. Um, sure. Like that, like website and, and social media posts and stuff um, for like gathering data as well. I'll be like, Hey, I'm trying to do this. What it would be a good, give me a few ideas. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. but I know people that are using it to do, um, my business partner built a uh, built a Python like script without knowing the language, just by yeah. being like, "I need it to do this," mm -hmm. and it like stuff like that is in, is is crazy. And yeah. um, I think like I've really changed my tune over the last like five years. Well, probably since the pandemic of like I try not to be mean, but like I used to. Uh, <laughs> I think the average person, like my uh, one of my managers, always says, "Think of." the average person you know and how smart they are half the population is dumber than that <laughs> right, right. <laughs> like i think a lot of people just aren't gonna get it and they're just right. and, and, and like i had this conversation a lot with nfts too where like the technology for non-fungible tokens is like going to be a big mainstay um, the, the best use cases I've seen is stuff like a uh, ticket master wants to put it on their tickets. So to prevent scalping, cause it's like, you know, there's a right. token or, um, yeah. and, uh, what Louis Vuitton wanted to do, like to, uh, <coughs> verify that they're not fakes. Cause there'll be a NFT associated with it. Right. But you know, what the media talks about is monkey picture for sells for a yeah. million dollars. And that's what yeah. everyone's talking about. And no matter yeah. how much I'm like, no, 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 no the technology is actually really cool. doesn't matter. Uh -huh. it's it's monkey picture is is what an nft is and i yeah. i find maybe chat GPT is not as bad but i i've talked to people that's the same way where it's like this is just clever bot 2.0 why would anyone use this and waste their time mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. but i think i there's people in my life that say the same thing about social media they're like you know there's there's no point of being uh, that was a via rail train but we'll still count it for number two um, you know, that th people are like, why would I have a cell phone? Why would I have social media and don't understand that like people, you know, make a living off of it. Um, Absolutely. and, uh, there's this, I think there's just always going to be more people than not that just goes right over their head. And, um, it is what it is. And I'm trying to get better at like, just being like, that's okay. I don't have to be angry at all these people. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's fine. Well, I, and, and I, th I think, I mean, you said it, there are people who are making a living at it and I think AI right now. And I, I've been, you know, I go through and I look at all the, it, it comes down to like prompt engineering and how you can use it and use it effectively. Uh, you mentioned also having it develop your, you know, whether it's your social media posts or save your time uh, for content creation. There's a so, rail train going the other way. <laughs> well, we're getting oh. close to, yeah, I was going to say we're getting close to the, the, <laughs> the 3.5. Yeah. Or should we count the via rail as a half? I think half, half of the viewers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. We'll count the two as half. So we're up to two then. So who, who had the yeah. under? Yeah. I, I, I was under. over. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, um, okay. but but yeah, I think right now it's one of these uh, really pivotal moments, honestly, in history where if someone if you can figure out how to leverage um, these tools, right? They're they're like in they're a multiplier of human effort, right? So if you have, you know, like you mentioned, you know, Willows, you're you're working like okay, it's kind of like three full time jobs right now, right? Um, but effectively, some some of these things that you were doing prior to AI and some of its so the social media work and and um, there's a lot of you'll deal with contracts and I don't know if you've leveraged it all at all with like you said you went through the books of ten different companies some of this stuff can be offloaded to AI if you know like you know what sort of data you want you can create your own GPT that you can like take these files I don't know how many files you were going through kind of thing but like drop them in there have it do some of the mining in there yeah. like that's the sort of way that it can be leveraged and save you several hours sitting in the office kind of looking through and now you can look at the books of 40 companies instead of 10 companies you know like that sort of and I'm just using that as like a, a yeah. very high level example but the way that you can like save yourself time and then get a lot more work done you know with just as much quality that, yeah, that's actually interesting because, yeah, because I could be like, I want a company that is, you know, between the range of $50,000 and $200,000 purchase price that's cash flowing approximately two grand a month or whatever that has a, like, I, yeah, plug in that yeah. information and shoots out whatever, right? Um, yeah, I use it a lot. I even like use it for, um, I'm really bad with wine pairings and right. people always ask me, oh, what does this pair well with? And I'm yeah, just yeah. like, I drink wine out of a bottle without a cup and like yeah. eat one meal a day. Like I just, I'm not good at it. So I've been using AI for that. Like just be like, hey, give me like, here's what my wine tastes like. Give me a bunch of uh, food pairings and stuff like that. Yeah. So that, that was a big thing. Um, yeah. yeah, and that's just like combining the, you know, the experience of every sommelier in the world into a you know into a little box i can type into is uh and when you do that do you go to chat gpt just like open and like or have you set up your own gpt because like I, I set up my own to help me with uh some more stuff i do at work with project management where i've already given it the parameters i've already told it like you know that it's a project manager and i, I uploaded some documents in there so that i want it to to use this kind of to reference sometimes and and done that sort of thing so now i have like it'll be like chat gpt and then it'll it'll have like the different gpts i've set up for different purposes so i don't have to tell it each time hey i'm i i have a winery and i'm asking you this question i just like that it already knows that stuff so i just click on it and then i i, I ask it a question it already has this context knowing that it's an expert project manager and has all this knowledge base. So do you, do you do that at all? Or do you, no, I, don't... I don't even know how to do that. So, but okay. that is, um, I know it's possible, but, uh, yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. Because that, that's, again, those are, those are some of the ways that I think like we can make ourselves more efficient and kind of learn, like we have to, we have to train ourselves to, to work with AI kind of thing. Right. It's, uh, yeah. And, and that's how we can save ourselves the effort. Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah, I definitely don't know enough about uh, AI and, and using ChatGPT or any of the other ones, but you guys have definitely uh, planted a few seeds in my head. It's like, okay, what could I be doing with AI to like, you know, make uh, the passive income pos podcast better or, you know, and I'm we, sure there's... I'm, you can literally just ask it that question, right? Yeah, <laughs> literally. Gonna... Yeah. That's what I was going to say. Like, even as like, uh, like, you know, sales and marketing is, is my department and sometimes I'm just having a non-creative day, but I need to, I know I need to do marketing. I'll just be like, hey, like, what's a, what do you think a successful way a winery within this, these, this size could advertise to its local market? And it'll spit out a bunch of stuff and it'll be like, okay, give me a hundred. And then I use that as like a jumping off point for myself, like almost just like inspiration, like the same way I would, you know, scroll Pinterest to get wedding ideas, for an example, like I just kind of scroll through that list to give myself, oh, like maybe that is a good idea. And then I start going more into that. So, yeah. um, you know, even simply it just kind of like, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting tool for sure. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um. A lot of talk about. I didn't know we were going to go down the AI rabbit hole. I'm glad we did, though, because it, it is a an int very interesting topic of conversation. Um, off the top, also very interesting learning or, or hearing, you know, Willow's history of the the winery and now into the stampery as well. And yes, I am using the word stampery because I've seen you tweet it so many times. <laughs> I stamp business. I think just like stampery. It's it's funny. Stampery sounds better. It, it like yeah. I didn't know that it wasn't a real word until you coined it. It sounded real to me. <laughs> yeah, I definitely made it up, but uh 
I mean, like it gets the point. It gets the point across, right? Right. <laughs> Winery, stampery. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah let's give it. Let's, uh, I guess, talk a little bit more. Uh, shifting back to Willow's story there in the uh, and that new location because you know I've seen some of the pictures you've posted and and the uh, like the restaurant space, the tasting room looks absolutely phenomenal. Um, so well done there on that renovation. Thank you. But also, like you said, you've kind of taken on quite a bit of debt to sort of make that happen. And I guess sort of the, the long-term vision or goal to obviously, you know, the goal is to be cash flow positive and to pay down that debt and eventually not be in debt or have a lot less debt. So um, I don't know, I guess maybe just, well, first give another shout out to the location of the, cause we have a lot more viewers now than we, than we did when you first said it, uh, the, the, the address there in Winnipeg and yeah, just, just go ahead. Sure. Yeah. So our winery is located at 483 Berry street in sunny St. James, Winnipeg, Manitoba, our three J one M seven. But, um, we, uh, yeah, so we have a location there. We have a hundred seats in the winery. So you can go, we do like wine tasting flights is one of our most popular things. So it's like five servings of three ounces of anything that's on the menu. Uh, typically we usually have about 15 different wines that we make in house. Uh, we do, uh, grape wines from the grapes that we grow. We also do local uh, prairie fruit wines. We do uh, meads from local honey, apple ciders, sangrias, wine coolers, stuff like that. So good kind of large selection. And then in our new place, what we've added is a uh, is a kitchen. Uh, before we just, just used to do like, um, you know, cheese and crackers and stuff. But now we have like flatbreads, paninis, charcuterie, uh, different things like that, um, which is managing a, um, I never wanted to own a restaurant um but here we are uh you know it's it's and it's not a restaurant it's a very simple menu um my culinary director uh made a i gave her the specific instructions to like make something that i can make because like i don't cook at all so like make it simple enough um that i can do it um but we use like all local ingredients for um for the food we'll work with like a local butcher a uh, local cheese maker uh, local mustard local baker uh, we're using like all manitoba stuff it's really important to us um to do stuff like that um but uh, yeah so we we basically for debt wise like I'm, I'm sure like you know if you've done due diligence on any public company before investing you know a lot of these giant companies have a lot of debt and um you know if I, I never subscribe to the whole Dave Ramsey, like all debt is bad, buy a house in cash, you idiot, and you can't do it. Just work a hundred hours a week and, until you can. Like I debt's a tool like any other. Um, I'm not even scared. Like I know, and then I'll even go one step farther to say, and this might be controversial, because I know a lot of people say like credit cards are fine as long as you don't accrue interest on them. I don't care about accruing interest on a credit card, honestly. Like 22% is what I'm paying on the credit card. If I can make more than 22% return, it doesn't matter if I'm carrying a balance on that card. That's how I've always um, kind of thought about it because with like a small business, um, my return on investment is is obscene. Like you can't get better than a small business for, for return, I think. Um, like we, my partner and I invested $25 um, of our own money each. So it was $50 that we split uh, to buy home winemaking equipment. And, um, I had to get the business valued, uh, to get life insurance on us. And they said it was worth over a million dollars. So if we do that math, $25 to my half would be, you know, $500,000 approximately is, is a pretty good ROI, um, better than I'm getting with my, my Tesla shares, <laughs> but, uh, we've we've carried a debt since day one basically mostly on like line of credits and stuff because we're in manufacturing right and especially with wine or uh, any alcohol that's not beer i guess like you're aging it uh, a lot of the time so most of my wines are aged 18 months so i'm paying let's just use a number like ten thousand dollars for a batch um that i don't see a return on at all for two years approximately because I got to pay for the the fruits. I got to pay for the labor to, you know, crush and, and, and rack it and, and whatever. I got to pay for the yeast. I got to pay for the bottles, the corks, the labels, the seals. Um, and, and the storage. Uh, You're and storing the storage. it for a year and a half. Exactly. So I just have stack in my new place. We got a lot of space. So I just have like stacks of pallets, um, but of, uh, of age aging wine. Um, and you can't see return. So it's like, 
that especially like starting you know in 2017 it's like where does that money come from to build to get the inventory up right mm -hmm. there, and we just had no money to start to burn into so it, the the debt was a necessity um someone like dave ramsey might uh, i'm going to keep shading him but like he might say like well you shouldn't have started a business then with zero dollars in the bank and maybe and that might be sage advice but uh <laughs> i did and um my I, I remember saying to my business partner very early on, like, you can't go double bankrupt. There's no <laughs> double bankruptcy court where you get a worse punishment. You're either bankrupt or you're not bankrupt. So I'm like, let's take every cent of debt that we possibly can personally and business wise, because if we go out of business, that's we lost. It's it's not like going out of business from a million dollars or two hundred thousand dollars makes a difference at all if you declare bankruptcy and close <clears> the corporation. <throat> Like we, so that, that was my mentality going in because like right before we opened, I was homeless for a brief stint there, like two months in, um, 2016. And, uh, I was just kind of like, what's the worst that can happen? Like, I'm just back exactly where I am right now, if this doesn't work. So we may as well just kind of, kind of go and use it. And, um, if we were saving the money up to do these renovations, it would have never happened or if it would have taken 10 years to happen because i was bottlenecked with how much money i could make like the opportunity to make money in this new place every day we'd go because we had a 10 person little tasting room in, a, in the last place every single day we'd get calls hey i got a 30 person retirement party i got a 40 person baby shower i all this stuff and i just had to be no and that was tens of thousands of dollars i was leaving on the table so to make that jump for the opportunity um to earn more income there there we there was no way we could have earned the income to get there if that makes sense so i think the debt is um you know it is what it is we also took like uh, i bought a piece of equipment um that was um north of two hundred thousand dollars um and that was um for uh canning for putting stuff in into cans myself and uh, we took debt on that as well um but i also signed that when um a prime plus six loan when prime was like 0.25 percent so that was uh i was like yeah and then now it's you know 14 yeah. or whatever a crazy amount on it that uh that it is but um i always just viewed especially in manufacturing the debt as any other tool um like any other you know tool i have at my disposal i have a crusher to crush grapes i have a bottling machine to fill bottles it's like the debt is a tool to get the opera like to open the avenues of revenue for the business so um i've never been scared of it personally but i think that makes um i know there's a lot of people that are the, the opposite camp of that but uh right I well know. i mean there are different types of debt right i mean clearly yeah. the debt that you're taking on is to <clears throat> to acquire assets um that are that are then being used to service the debt kind of thing this is very different from consumer debt where someone just you know wants new shiny things and yeah right. and, and i guess like i never really had vices like i live pretty like all I, i've said this before like you know the the, the big div twet accounts always have like the engagement bait bank where they're like how much money would it cost for you to never work again um like all i ever needed was two thousand dollars a month if i could make 24 grand a year when I was on Serb, I was laughing. I was living like a king. I was getting skipped the dishes every day. I was just buying whatever yeah. I wanted. Um, right. That's all I ever needed. It was like, if I could make $24,000 a year um, yeah. passively, uh, I would never have to worry about it again. And um, so I live pretty, you know, whatever. So all, all my, yeah. <laughs> so all my money in the last decade has gone into my business, basically. And we pay ourselves, like my partner and I, often choose to pay ourselves uh less than we can afford or like less than like the business could afford to pay us more but we decided to pay ourselves less because i prioritized um growing the business rather than well what am i gonna do with the money like eat out one more time that month or get a better car or like what am i doing with the money rather than like i would rather set myself up um for success in the future yeah I think that's a great point um, about the debt uh, that Ryan made about like you're going into this debt, but you're accumulating the assets to service the debt, which is very, very different than than the consumer debt that we talk so much about on, uh, on you know, in the FinTwit and Twitter community where it's like, yeah, somebody's just running up 
you know, ten, twenty thousand dollars in credit card debt and and have nothing really to show for it at the end of the day. Whereas, you know, very, very different when it's sort of this business debt that is being used wisely, right? I would agree well, with that. Uh, well, and like when I bought the stampery, I just put the like I took a loan to buy it and I just put the loan on the books of the stampery and just it pays it off every month, which like I don't I don't know if people know you could do that, <laughs> but it's like I basically bought it with no money down. Um, mm -hmm. We did a like I my partner and I between the two of us put fifteen thousand. We bought it for one hundred and ten, uh, so I put like seventy five hundred down of per, my personal funds. My business partner Zach put down seventy five of his, and then the um, owners, the previous owners, um, vendor took back or vendor taked back, vendor took back, vendor took back. Mm -hmm. um, Fifteen thousand, so they match that. So basically, that we owe them fifteen thousand dollars a year from uh, acquiring, and then we just loan the rest from the bank. The whatever it was, seventy five, seventy seven thousand, or whatever it was. Um, so I basically bought the business for seven thousand um, dollars. That's like we did thirty thousand dollars in February in sales. Right. Um, wow. So we did say, uh, yeah, we're having the the previous owners like stayed on to uh train us and i still text them like if i have a weird question or something and uh one of them was making a joke she was just like uh of course the best year we have in five years is the year i sell like of course <laughs> like but uh because they did they had a covid dip because like lawyers and stuff weren't in the office so a lot of the that revenue schools whatever was like just uh, not happening so the year before we bought them they had done like 180 uh in gross revenue um and like we've already passed that in in eight months of of owning it so it's uh right. I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about the purchase okay i have another question for you willows and this mm -hmm. is going to be fun <laughs> i'm not sure if ryan knows the backstory here <laughs> how many shares of rio can do you own now <laughs> three <laughs> because ryan, do you know any of this backstory <laughs> no i have rio can but i don't know the, i don't know the backstory here now <laughs> so Rio oh, Cat, which is a Canadian REIT real estate investment trust, um, is one of Dave's favorite stocks. I think that's fair to say. It's, um, it's, yeah, it's definitely one of my favorites for sure. And uh, I had one share, and I, I so if people don't know me on uh, on my finance Twitter, that's Drunk Dividends uh, on Twitter. <laughs> um, I, I post like I'm very my whole mentality with like the, the reason I started the finance Twitter, which is like separate from my other stuff, is because I wanted to be super transparent with all the money that I'm investing uh, because yeah. I this that was what I wanted to do. And I think it's important. And uh, so I post every single dividend that I receive. So my one share of Rio can was getting me what nine cents a month or Correct, whatever nine cents <laughs> per month <laughs> and so i was posting that every time i got it the nine cents and uh <laughs> and dave said you got to buy more of that you go i want to see those numbers up and i'm like if you buy me a share i'll buy another share <laughs> so i wake up one day and he had e-transferred me the 13 dollars or whatever it was to buy the $18, share I think 18 dollars canadian and uh and yeah. so I bought two shares. So now I now I have three, and I get uh, what twenty one cents a month from, uh, from Rio Cat. But how I made the argument to Dave was that in like if he gives me the money to buy the share, that's more volume, drives the price up. His investment <laughs> does better. So in theory, he's helping out his own investment portfolio Sick by giving him yeah that one share, share just drove months. that volume up like you, <laughs> you should have i seen mean in theory that. that's how stocks work right more people buy it at a higher price and then the price more demand. there's more demand <laughs> it's, like, it's economics 101 day right uh, yeah <laughs> no honestly that, that was just sort of very fun because you're right i i had seen you posting that nine cents like for for so many months and probably a year right like nine cents nine cents nine cents and then I, you know, I, and I, over that course of that year, I kept saying like, you got to buy at least one more share. You'll double that, go from nine to 18 cents. You'll, you'll double it with one share. Right. Yeah. And then, yeah, we did come to that agreement where it was like, okay, I'll send you the 18 bucks to buy one more share, but you've got to match it. So he, yeah. yeah, that, so we made that agreement. He matched it and he bought two more shares. So he's up to three. And so now it's fun to see him post the, cause he's still posting yeah. every month. And I see that yeah. 27 cents a month and I'm like, I feel like I've invested nine cents uh, a month into you. 
what prompted you to buy one share in the first place? When I first started stock investing, um, I did not know anything. And I was just buying whatever I heard about, basically. So I have a lot of like, and like, I'm, if I'm up on the position and it pays a dividend, I'm like pretty hesitant to like get rid of the position. I'm like, I don't really care. Um, So I have a lot of like, just kind of hold over like one or two, like less than 10 shares of, of companies that just like, I should probably um, consolidate, consolidate, but I don't know. I just couldn't be bothered right now um but i am trying to focus i have like four tickers now that i'm putting money into um and like the only individual stock really i'm buying is uh northwest company is my favorite uh individual stock to buy um and then i still do my like every time i eat at a and w i buy an a and w share but uh ask that same question about the what are the four tickers by the way that wasn't actually an idea i had at the start of last year but i i never followed through on it but you you did yeah yeah um so yeah Nor- uh, northwest company is like the only individual stock i really put money into uh xei which is a blackrock uh dividend monthly dividend um etf okay. and then um i i th- like i think blackrock is the most evil company in the world <laughs> So that's where I like to buy from them because I think they're most suited to make me the most money. Right. Um, so then I do their um, S&P 500 um, one, I think XUS, I want to say. And then um, one other of their ETFs that I thought was... Yeah, the TSX? No, they got some exposure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, so mostly mostly those. But I haven't been I haven't put in any more money into my uh, brokerages. Uh, I haven't really been taking a paycheck um, the last this quarter because uh, it's historically my uh, my slowest quarter for the winery. And then all the debt I'm servicing, I have cut my pay to, to basically nothing between right. the companies. But um, hopefully this summer is going to be good. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, I'm sure it will be. Well, guys, I see we've already been going at it for well over an hour here. Um, before we sign off, is there sort of any other points that any anyone would like to make? No, just uh, it was great to meet you, Willows, and uh, thanks again, Dave. And uh, yeah, the conversation. I, I thought we'd be talking more about stocks. I think we, we went on a lot of a lot of interesting tangents. So a couple uh, went down a few rabbit holes. That's okay. <laughs> I try to be like useful and not just rant about my experiences i try to be like no but this is how you could do because like i don't know i i I find there's a lot of there's a lot of like not misinformation but a lot of people kind of like uh there's too many like gurus and stuff that talk about like oh it's so easy to start a small business and just just flip stuff on amazon and stuff like that so i like to like kind of this like give the reality of uh starting and running small businesses is kind of my style of uh social media at least but uh well you said it and i mean i mean the whole point that you started what you're doing on the div twit side is um you want to be transparent and that's exactly the same reason my brother and i we started our get rich brothers.com site as well was just just to be transparent i mean I, most of my posts these days in the beginning we used to post more about strategy and that sort of thing but these days i pretty much at least get my one post a month in just to say how many dividends you know how much i earn in dividend income passive income over the course of the past month so and it's just my actual numbers and one of the reasons is because uh, to your point there's a lot of people talking you know you can't trust a lot of what you get on the internet but uh, i like to just say like this is what i'm doing you know yes. no i read it on the internet my, my numbers. <laughs> let's say that again dave sir Oh, I read it on the internet, so it has to be true. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and I, I think I mentioned this uh, maybe before to you, Dave. But um, I've had people say like, I've actually been accused of like lying about my dividends, and it's like if I was lying, why wouldn't I like add an extra zero or something? Like, like <laughs> yeah, it's like these, yeah. these aren't like crazy numbers, these numbers, right? Yeah, Photoshop <laughs> you in front of a Lamborghini. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Like I I respect people that don't want to post about their finances like that's fine but what i hate is the people that are like you need to do this and then they post a screenshot where you can see a 500 percent gain but they like block yeah. out what the number is like yeah, yeah, yeah. if you're gonna post anything post it all yeah, otherwise yeah. it's just what are we talking about like why then 
Yeah. And you just get a lot of people that are like, then you start going down the thread and then it's like, oh yeah, join my Forex trading group. And then it's like, oh, exactly. there exactly. it is. Like, so exactly. I, I'm not trying to sell any, anything to anyone except wine and stamps. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I'm not trying to sell a course on how to you know run a small business or anything. I'm just giving my experience as a small business owner, um, which I think is, uh, yeah, it sounds like you're doing something similar with the investing, which is like, uh, that's, I respect it. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Likewise. Um, yeah, no, that's good. Great, great chat today. Um, <laughs> and, uh, hopefully do it again sometime, uh, Dave and Willows and, uh, definitely anyone else we can bring along <laughs> shop local and, Willows, and so follow me on everything. The wine. So you can stop yeah. drinking wine out of a bottle. We'll need to get you one of these, uh, passive income posse <laughs> coffee mugs. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, yeah. I basically drink alcohol and then sparkling water. That's literally all. That's the only thing I consume <laughs> calorie wise. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you guys for being here. Thank you for everyone uh, uh, that has uh, joined. Didn't have anything in the chat, but that's okay. We have quite a few viewers. So thank you for everybody for joining in to, uh, to check out the conversation. I truly appreciate everyone's time for coming on and spending some time with me here on the passive income podcast and of course if you are watching this on youtube please hit subscribe and if you're watching on any of the other platforms please hit the follow button uh thank you everyone thank you so much and we'll see you again next time